What's up, South Bay Church? All right, you guys awake today? I'm awake. I've been awake since 4 a.m. Ever happened to you in your old age? You just wake up wide awake? I don't know if I'm old or not, but I did wake up wide awake because I think God wants to do something really significant today. It's been an awesome day for us at all of our campuses. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. I got a question for you to start the message today. Have you ever told yourself there's something you would never do, but then you ended up doing it anyways later on in life? Like you promised yourself you'd never do it? Like I said, I would never wear skinny jeans, (laughs) but look at me now. Here I am with skinny jeans with holes in them on top of that. That's what happens when you let your wife pick out your wardrobe. Um, How about this? I said I would never go to a Taylor Swift concert. And I did. And I was screaming like a 12-year-old girl in (laughs) in the fourth row. I mean, I said I'd never do it. Now, one thing that happened to me I promised I would never do um, happened around my 30th birthday. Now, first of all, you have to understand about me. I don't like surprises. I hate surprises. I heard some of our staff members were going to do some surprises around April Fool's. I said, don't do it. If you want a job, don't do it. (laughs) Just kidding, kind of. But, you know, there's a sense in which I don't like surprises. So Stacy, she knows, like, how to figure out how to give me a surprise. My wife, Stacy, if you don't know, that's her name. And um, sometimes she'll do it in a way that I can't figure it out, but I like to figure things out. So one time, about six weeks before I'm about to turn 30, back in 2011, so you know my age, um, one time I was in my bedroom and she handed me an envelope. And I'm like, what is this for? And she said, well, read it. So I start reading it. And as I'm reading it, it's this pretty note about my 30th birthday, which is six weeks away. I'm like, this is not my 30th birthday. And she said, your surprise for your 30th birthday is something you said you would never do. And I'm like, oh, no, (laughs) I'm not doing that. She's like, yes, you are. And finally, I got down to the bottom and it said, you are jumping out of a perfectly good airplane and you are doing it today. And my face just went white. I might as well have passed out. I mean, my heart started racing and I started looking up. So I got my phone. I'm still trying to decide if I'm going to do it. So I got my phone. I researched death rate of skydiving on Google. (laughs) And I found out that you're more likely to die in a car accident than you are in a skydiving accident. That's good to know, right? So I said, I I, I might be able to do it, but I'm still not certain. So she says, actually, you know what? All of our friends are coming. So you've got to do it. You're a coward if you don't. So I said, okay, I'll I'll, I'll do it. So we we start driving there. On the way, I'm like looking on Yelp to figure out if there's any reviews, like somebody who died wrote a review on there or something. I don't know how they would do that. But so I'm reading the reviews. I get there. And you know, when you get there, these places don't make you feel any better. You know, it's a guy like, you know, with one tooth and it's like, you know, sign it across the dotted line. If you die, you, you know, don't worry, don't worry about it. We got you. You're, don't, don't sue us if you die, like how you'd sue if you did die. But, you know, it's just crazy. And then they show you the airplane and you're like, really? That's like a World War I airplane. We're really going up in that thing? They're like, yep, that's what plane we're going in. So we, we got in the plane. And um, on top of that, once you get in, if you're, unless you're a professional, you fly tandem, which means that actually you have to sit on a guy's lap the whole time. I've never sat on somebody's lap before. I've never sat on a guy's lap my whole life. So um, never before, never since. So you're sitting on this guy's lap and you're circling, you're going up and you're like, you could let us out now. And they're like, no, we're still going. So you just keep circling and going higher and higher. By the time we're done, I'm seeing Mexico on my left and Canada on my right. I'm looking out. And they say, okay, now here's how it's going to happen. They're going to open the window and the wind's just going to come at your face. You're going to feel it. And then you just step out on the ledge. That's all you have to do. And then when you get out there on the ledge, we'll just push you out, just straight push you out. So I stepped out on the ledge and they pushed me out and I started screaming like a middle school girl. Second, I got out there and I'm like screaming all the way down, all the way to the bottom and you land. And the first thing out of my mouth was, when can I do that again? That was unbelievable. I just, I just needed somebody to push me out. Have you ever had times in your life where there was a part of you that wanted to do something, but there was a part of you that didn't and you just needed somebody to push you off of the ledge? See, that's how faith is a lot of times for us. I think you're here and you're listening to this message because there's a part of you that wants to do what God wants you to do. There's a part of you that wrestles, even though you might be agnostic or atheist, there's a part of you that wonders if there really is a purpose to your life, if there really is a reason why you're, you're here. 
And today I want to speak to that part of you. I want to speak to that part of you that on your best days wonders what it would fully be like to trust in God. And I am your instructor pushing you on the ledge to say that there's more in you, that God wants to do so much in you and through you if you will open your heart to what it is that he wants to say to you. We're in the middle of a series called Ge on generosity called Multiply. And we're talking about what it means to fully relinquish control of our resources and finances. And I think that this is an area for so many of us that we've been in bondage for our entire lives. And God wants to bring liberty and freedom to us today in this area. So I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn to Malachi chapter 3. If you do have a Bible, go to Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. It's the book right before there. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Somebody once said that this is Malachi, the Italian prophet. <laughs> Actually, it's Malachi. And we're going to look today at a story from Malachi. Now, let me tell you a little bit of what's going on in Malachi. Malachi is a book that was written to the people of God right before the New Testament. So this is the last thing that God's going to say before Jesus comes. And the Israelites at this point are back in the promised land. Now, this is significant because many times before, as a result of their disobedience, they've gotten removed from the promised land. In fact, they had spent 70 years in exile one time right before this because of their worship of foreign idols. And God now in his grace and mercy brings them back to the promised land. And the temple is rebuilt, which represents the presence of God. And the walls around Jerusalem have been rebuilt as well. But somehow in the midst of this, after the symbolic nature of God bringing them back to Israel, they're still missing out on the blessing that God has for them. So their life is kind of blessed, but not fully blessed. You ever feel like that? Like there's a part of you that God's blessing, but there's a part of you that you're still struggling and you're still inching along and you feel like maybe there's more to God. Maybe there's more that God wants to do in my life and through my life. Well, that's where the Israelites were. And Malachi, the word means messenger, and he delivers a series of messages to the Israelites. It's almost like a courtroom uh, case where the, everything is laid out and God's on one side and the people are on another. And there's this first incrimination that God has towards the people. It's in chapter one. And God is giving this incrimination where the Israelites, when it came time to worship, they weren't giving God their best. In fact, back in their day, which I'm really glad this is not our situation, they would bring in animals to worship. They would bring in sacrificial lambs, sacrificial goats. Imagine how that would shrink our attendance overnight. It's like, where's your goat? Did you bring your goat today? Thank God, thank Jesus, we don't have to do that anymore. Amen? Amen. And in their culture, they were bringing in these lambs, but they were bringing in lame lambs and Sparky the dog with no hind legs. I mean, they were doing all this stuff to bring in these animals that were spotted and cursed and God brings an incrimination against them, and he says, you're not giving me your best. You're actually giving me your leftovers. And how often is it in our lives that we want God to give his best, but we bring God leftovers? We're like, you can have this. This is my leftovers. And God is saying to them, actually, if you would get this right, it would change everything. But I want us to notice, I'm going somewhere with all this. I want us to notice that God's first statement to the Israelites was directed at the priest. It was directed at the leaders because if a leader gets it right, then the people will follow. If the leader brings their best to God, the people inevitably will come alongside and say, I want to bring my best to God too. That's why I'm so grateful for so many of our leaders here at South Bay who bring their best. I love Josh and Sweet who sing up here. Josh was telling me one time in the green room that he had taken all day Friday off to practice three songs to stand on this stage. That's unbelievable to me. I thought somebody would clap for that. <laughs> that, he would, that he would care so much about what he would give to God that he would bring his best. I'm so grateful for our hundreds of Bay Kids workers who love kids and invest in them and prepare for the weekend. I'm grateful for our production crew that stands back there and pushes buttons. I don't even attempt to go into that booth because if I did, I'd break it. But they, they know which ones to press when, and they're trying their best to bring their best to God because they know when we bring our best, God meets us at our best. And God can do infinitely more than we think or imagine when we're bringing our best and he's coming along with his faithfulness. 
So God is saying to the Israelites, if you'll, if you'll bring your best, you'll experience a different side of me. But he doesn't stop with the leaders. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 6 through 12, he's going to go on to the rest of the people. And that's what we're going to spend our time focusing on in Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Let's watch what God says to the people. For I, the Lord, do not change. How many of you are glad that God doesn't change? His character doesn't change? You know, if God could change, that would make the statement that God's not perfect, that there's something about him that needs to change. Some of you guys who are students right now, when I was a student, I don't know if they still do this with students, but when I was a student, people would sign their yearbooks. Remember they'd say at the end, always stay the same. It's like, bro, if you are like you are when you're 17, same guy at 35, that's a problem. Some things need to change, right? But God, you can stay, you can say to God, stay the same. He, he doesn't need us to say it, but he's perfect. So he's been perfect. He will be perfect. So that's the confidence that God wants to bring into you and to the Israelites. He's saying, I will be the same. You can have confidence. I've been faithful. I will be faithful. I never change. Therefore, he says back to them, he says, therefore, or from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and you have not kept them. He's saying to them that, that I am merciful, I am gracious, but you, you keep running away from me. There's this part of you that wants me to bless you, but there's this part of you that wants to turn from me. And he says to them, even though you're disobedient, you're not consumed, which means God could give greater consequences than he does. What they deserve and what they're worth are two totally different things. My kids sometimes have this statement where they say, that's not fair. Anybody else? Any kids say, that's not fair. We can't have tech time. That's not fair. I'm like, I'll show you what's fair. You deserve an eternal damnation apart from Christ in a place called hell due to your sin and iniquity. I'm just kidding. I don't say that, but I just, I think it, I think it, I think it. Fairness died in the garden of Eden when sin entered into the world. Now, we deserve eternity apart from God at a place called hell, but God, he deems us as worthy of him sending his son to die on a cross for us. That's how much he loves you, that you would be the object of your, his affection. So the scripture is saying, like, you deserve this, but God is saying, I love you so much. In fact, he's saying, if you return to me, I'll return to you. God might be disappointed with us, but he never gives up on us. That's good news. You've been turning your back, but God's saying, I'm just... I'm going to keep pursuing, and the moment you turn back to me, I'll turn to you, and you'll experience my favor and my grace in your life. Well, how do we return to you? He says back, they say back to him, and God says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? Now, this is a very powerful statement. Anybody ever been robbed before, just out of curiosity? Okay, it's not fun, is it? No, I got robbed recently. Um, somebody stole my wallet from my car in my garage. My garage was open, but they stole it from me. So I, I think it's robbing, right? And they came in, they took it, they stole my identity. There's another Andy Wood rolling around in Silicon Valley, which is a big problem. And they've been opening bank accounts. They've been, you know, taking a bunch of stuff out in my name. So if you're here, would you please identify yourself <laughs> so JC can take you out? But <laughs> It's not fun to be robbed. So I'm on the phone with AT&T and Wells Fargo and Bank of America every day trying to figure these things out. Robbing is a big deal. So God uses this language, you've robbed from me, is very powerful, significant language. So they ask back to God. Remember, it's like a courtroom. They ask back to God. They say, well, how, how are we robbing you? And God makes a statement. In your tithe and your contribution, that's how you're robbing me. There's this one principle, there's this one thing that you, you've embraced all this other stuff, but this one thing you haven't embraced it, and it's to trust me with the first tenth of your income to give it back to me, to believe that I can provide for you, that the 90% more blessed by God is better than the 100% in your hands, if you will trust me. And then God goes on to say something he does not say at all in the Bible, before this or after this, and that's why it's so important for us to really hear what God says to his people. 
Because this is not just an isolated situation of a group of people under the law. This is the heart of God for humanity. It's a principle that God put in place before the law that was resulting in a curse upon them because they weren't obeying it as a nation, as a people of God. So he says this, you ultimately bring the tithe into the storehouse that there might be food. Excuse me, you are cursed with a curse. Back to verse nine. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house and put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing so much that there is no more need for you. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy you. The first fruit of your soil, it will be blessed. Your vine in the field shall not fail to bear fruit, says the Lord of hosts, and then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. God said, test me. See if I don't bless you. Recently, I um, got a new car. I shared a little bit of this last week, electric car. It's a lot of anxiety around that now. Like you think running out of electricity on your phone is a big deal? <laughs> Try telling somebody you ran out of electricity in your car on the side of the road. I mean, I'm just like living with this new level of anxiety. But when I went to get the car, I sat down with the salesman. We had a conversation. They get your info. They want to know more about you. They want to bait you, get you in, talking to you, trying to sell you this car, lease the car. And then finally they say, why don't you go test it? You know what I'm talking about? Because they know what happens if you go test it. If you haven't made the decision yet, what are you going to do? You're going to go and you're going to be like, oh, I like this. Look at me in this Nissan Leaf. I'm, I'm just like... I'm like Batman up in here. This is unbelievable. Because they know if they can get you in the leaf or a car, then you're going to buy it or you're going to lease it. They have so much confidence in their product that they know with a test drive, you're good. How is it that somebody who works at Nissan and is trying to get you to take a leaf has more confidence in the test than we often do in the creator and sustainer of the universe? See, God is saying to us today, if you will test me, you will see my faithfulness. So my message today is titled, Test the Window. If you'd like to write down titles of messages, it's to test the window. And testing is a matter of trusting. It's a matter of do I have confidence that the one on the other side of the window can provide. So today what I want to do is I want to challenge you to trust God and test the window of his blessing. Now, we play all kinds of games with the window. In fact, some games are good, some games are bad, but I want to talk to you about some of the games that we play with the window of God's provision into our lives. And the first of these games that we play is this. It's the closed window game or the locked window game. It's that we say, you know what, God, you can have any area of my life, but I'm not giving you this. So what we do is we take the window, we shut it, we lock it, and we say, God, you, you can come over here. So we might open up another window in our life, but not this one. You can have my relationships. I'll serve at the church. I'll, I'll even stop looking at pornography. I will, I will. But back here, this whole issue of money, that's not yours. So we're, in, we're, we're worshiping, and we got one hand up, praising God, but one hand on our wallet just to make sure somebody don't walk by and pull it out. <laughs> know what I'm saying? It's like, you can have all these areas, but not this one. And God sent me today to tell you that when you lock the window, it's no longer a window, it's a wall. And some of us have walled God out of our lives. We've created a reality where we don't even need God to come through for us. It's like in marriage, you know, sometimes marriage starts out great and it gets bad over the course of time and you meet a lot of married couples who've been doing this thing for a long time and they're not really spouses anymore, they're just now roommates. So he's in one room and she's in another. Now, JC, if you snore, that might be a good strategy. But, um, but he's in one room and she's in the other. They got separate bank accounts. They're, they're, they, they don't mix calendars and they're just together. It's like roommates. Some of us are trying to play the roommate game with God. And we're missing out on all that God wants to do in our lives. The test 
is a matter of trust. And the degree to which you are willing to open the window is indicative of the level of trust that you have in God and his ability to provide for you. And the degree to which you're willing to open the window will determine how much of God's faithfulness you'll experience in your finances. So if the window is locked and then we're like, well, God didn't provide for me. He didn't take care of me. No, duh, he didn't provide for you. It's like he's over here trying to bless you and provide for you, but the window is closed, so you can't experience any of his provision. The only reason to keep the window closed is if what's on the other side, you don't want it, if it's not good. So some of us have this understanding of God's character that he's trying to take from you. When God, when he speaks to this subject, says, I am not trying to get you to give so that I can take from you. I'm trying to get you to give so that I can give to you. So if I know I can get it, like I said last week, through you, I'll get it to you, God says. So the window's closed. It's locked. I can't get it to you. It's not going through you, and you're not experiencing my faithfulness in your life. One time when I was a kid, my brother, who's four years younger than me, my only full biological brother, we would fight sometimes when we were kids. I would always win, but we'd fight sometimes. And uh, on one particular occasion, we're fighting each other, and he starts chasing me. And I run out the front door, and it's one of those big old glass window doors. You know what I'm talking about? The whole thing's glass. So I get on the other side of it, and I just slam it closed. Well, I slam it closed, and guess what happens to the whole door? It shatters. It goes everywhere. I got this huge scar still as an adult because I tried to slam the window shut. I didn't want what was on the other side coming to me. But God is saying, I want to bless you. I want to pour out provision upon you. That's why what we do with grow track is so important. Every week during the services, we have what we call grow track. The first week of every month is about knowing God. And we have a whole class designed around this because we believe that if you could truly see God for how loving and gracious and merciful and kind he is, then you would want to go through all the windows in your house and just fling them wide open and say, God, I want what you have for me. So the window gets locked, but that's not the only game we play. Sometimes we play the game where we crack the window. You know what I'm saying? The only reason to crack the window is if you want just a little bit of what's on the outside to get in. So we're like, you know, you can get a little bit to me. I don't know if I can get it to the people on the front row, but I'm trying. Uh, but we crack it for God and we say, you know, God, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of this area of my life. And the window of our finances, we just, we just trust him a little bit. The degree to which the window is open, let me say it again, is the degree to which you will experience the faithfulness of God in this area of your life. And some of us have been circling around this window for years. Any high school students in here, just out of curiosity? No high school students in this service. Just yell if you're in high school. No, no. Any college students? Anybody who's ever been a high school student? <laughs> Anybody who's ever been a college student? You know what I'm talking about? How many of you guys know those people that just change their major like 30 times? Like <laughs> never dealing with the fact that they needed an education. I'm in, I'm in lit. I'm, in, I'm an economic major now. I'm, I, I'm starting to feel drunk walking around this. But isn't that the way some of us live our lives in terms of our faith? It's like we keep circling around the same thing over and over and over and over again. Still, so we're still freshmen when God said, no, you should be a senior. You should be in 101, 201, 30. You should be in grad school, PhD level in your faith. But we never dealt with the window. So we got to go back to the subject of your willingness to trust me with this area of your life. Some of us don't have any stories of God's faithfulness, not because God is not faithful to you, but because his faithfulness is on the other side of a closed window. Get it to me, God. That's all you got. That's your crack. It might be a little bit good, but I'm not sure if it's really that good that I want to open it for you. So we lock the window. We crack the window. It's a little bit quiet. We lock the window. We crack the window. But then here's another game we play. This one's kind of funny to me because I think that this is a game that a lot of us play with the window. We forget about the window. It's kind of like this. We open the window for a while, 
But then when we walk away, the window just kind of closes on us and we forget about it. It's like my kids, three kids, 10, eight, and three. Two of our kids are intentionally disobedient most of the time. <laughs> now, we're grateful for the grace of God, and we believe that the Holy Spirit will change their lives, and we're speaking hope over them <laughs> that their hard hearts will be softened. And we are confident of the fact that our, our measure of greatness as parents is not indicated by the perfection of their behavior. We just keep telling ourselves that. One day, we're going to break through. Can I get a good amen for some, some of the parents? One day, it's going gonna, it's gonna to click in. Now, they are... They are I'm like, sometimes I'm like, do this. They're like, no. I'm like, yes, no, yes, okay. You want me to pay for college? I don't say that, but I think it. I'm like, come on, give me a yes. See, that's the intentional defiance. But then there's another kind of de defiance or disobedience in our household, and that's the unintentional disobedience. Like, we have one of our kids who is yes, ma'am, yes, sir, but then walks away and forgets what they said yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, to. Anybody have one of those kids? It's unbelievable. Now, in case you don't know this, the two that are intentionally defiant are the ones that are our genetic offspring, okay? <laughs> so Stacy and I have decided that the world should not be populated with any more human beings that are the combination of our two genetic offspring. There's something about the strong will combined. We're like, okay, we'll just adopt from this point forward. So... Um, so we took care of that problem. But the, 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 the middle child, he's unintentionally defiant. He says he's going to do it. He says he wants, to make, he wants to obey. But do you know, the other day, Stacy took this boy to school. She got to school. She tells him every day before they get into the car, take your book bag and take your shoes with you. You got your shoes? Got your, yes, ma'am. I got my shoes. Yes, ma'am. I got my book bag. She got to school. That brother did not even have his shoes with him. <laughs> I'm like, well, you should have shown him Moses and holy ground and just sent him out the door. I mean, it's unbelievable. But isn't it amazing how sometimes unintentional disobedience is just as damaging as intentional disobedience? And some of us, we want to obey God. We want to do what God wants us to do. But we go to church on Sunday. We're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to. It's yours. It's yours. Monday morning. Oh, I forgot about that over there. I got all this other stuff I got to take care of. And that's why for us, with automating generosity, it's so huge, because I don't want to leave something so significant in my life left to chance, to say, God, I want this area of my life habitually to become a reality that I would trust you with my finances. So today, if that's where you are, if you have unintentionally let the window close, God wants to give an opportunity to you. He wants to give an opportunity to those who have the closed window, those who have a crack window. And I love how this passage is so perfectly put together that God says this, test me, I dare you, test me in this and watch and see if I will not open up the floodgates of heaven, the windows of heaven so much that you have no room left for it. He's helping reframe our understanding of his provision because some of us were like, we think God's got this little, oh, stanky gun, can't do nothing with it to provide. But did you know that God has more than enough? I have always wanted to mess with people in the back. If you sit up front, this doesn't happen. But you know, there's a sense in which, that's like SeaWorld right there, Shamu coming at you. That God has more than you need. He does. He's not lacking in supply. He's not looking at the stock market saying, oh my gosh, when it goes down 0.25, the Dow Jones is adjusted and I'm struggling financially. There is a reason why God calls himself the Lord of hosts. He's like a Filipino woman at her party with all her goods, and she's got more than enough. You come in, there's more than enough lumpia for you. God is saying, I got more than you need. If you will trust me and open the window, there is no limit to what I can do. I can get it to you, he says. And today... If the window is closed, if it's cracked, if it's forgotten about, God today is making this incredible invitation to you to open up the window and let his provision come through into your life. I was driving on Wednesday with my son to school and he heard that we were giving away our Jeep. He loves the Jeep. So he said to me, Dad, 
are you sure you want to give away the Jeep? Because I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to. And I'm going to thank you for your logic and your reasoning here, son. Um, which is cool, you know, I'm like, uh, thank you for the suggestion. I loved all the suggestions of those who told me who they thought we should give the Jeep to as a church. I especially love those suggestions that the Lord told you I was supposed to give it to you. Thank you for those as well. Um, but you know, there's a part of me internally that just laughs at it because I have watched the faithfulness and the favor of God in our lives that every time we trust him, it's not that it's easy. It's not that I don't have that internal struggle and argue with God on the front end, but it's every time I have opened up my hands to God, when I sensed him prompting me to do something or give something away, when I went like this, God just flooded our lives over time with his faithfulness and with his provision. And today he's wanting to, he's wanting to bless you. I hope if you don't hear anything else I say today, it's that God wants to provide for you. He wants to be found faithful by you. He's not this far off, distant God holding the cosmos in order without a personal relationship with humanity. He is both omnipresent, omnipotent, he's strong, he's omniscient, he knows everything, but he is near and he wants to be faithful to you. He wants you to experience his provision in your life. And he's asking you, will you open the window? And here's the deal. Your job and my job is not to make sure that it keeps flowing. Your job and my job is simply to open the window to God, to say, it's yours. I give it to you. You might have lost your job. I can get it to you. You might be going through divorce. I can still get it to you. You might be in this place of depression and struggling and wonder. I can still. It doesn't matter what your circumstance is. If the window's open, I can get it to you. And how amazing is it that conditions in our life can change overnight, especially in the area of our finances? You know, a couple of years ago, we went through this drought, and I don't want to make light of the drought for all the farmers in our mix, because there's a lot of people in California depend on rain, and we needed the rain. But it was amazing the way that some people responded. You know, like some of you, you have rocks in your front yard now, right? <laughs> your backyard's green, but you have rocks in your front yard, because you don't want anybody to see you water in the backyard. But, but you, you change your front yard. There were people even moving out of California because the drought. There were people saying that the market's going to crash and it's going to be Armageddon. I am legend up in here. Like this whole thing has fallen apart. And then El Nino came and the heavens opened and God started pouring down rain and it started coming and it kept coming and it kept coming and it kept coming and Anderson Dam got filled up and then it started overflowing and it started going. It was just going all the way, all throughout Silicon Valley. It just kept coming and coming and coming and coming. You might be in a drought right now, but God is saying to you, if you open the window, it can go from drought to flood season overnight if you will trust me, if you will believe me. And what I bring is good. My provision, my blessing, it will be so much that you don't know what to do with it. So I'm going to ask you, will you test me in this? Will you test my faithfulness to see my ability to provide for every need that you have? And I love how Malachi finishes this thought. He goes back to this idea of God blessing you. And he says, and then all nations will rise up. They will call you blessed for yours Almighty is the Lord of hosts. Your land will be a delight, says the Lord of hosts. The God of the universe wants to bless you so that people all around you look. And there's almost a hilarious nature to it. How did that happen? I don't know. God provided. God cared for her. God blessed him. God took care of that family. It wasn't the stock market. It wasn't their job. It was God. It was his faithfulness and his provision into their lives. I had this image as I was praying this morning for you and wrestling through my message. And I remembered a couple of stories when I was meditating on that verse and trying to, I knew that there was something God wanted to say at the end of the message, but I, I didn't get there yet. And God brought to mind a story of a moment in our lives 
about eight years ago before we started South Bay, eight and a half now. I'd flown out to the Bay Area. I didn't know anybody. And some pastor said, hey, um, we got a place for you. You can stay in our house for a few days and you can check out the Bay Area while, you, while you're here and we won't charge you. And so I went to their house and I was having a conversation with the wife of this pastor and we were talking about the church and the vision we believed God had put in our heart and having a great conversation. And then she asked me a question that made the conversation turn south. And she said to me, she said, hey, do, do you want your wife to work or stay at home? Which is always funny because it's not like staying at home isn't work, right? And she asked me the question. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says that women can't have jobs out of the house and that's a whole nother conversation. So God bless you, whatever you choose. But for us and our family, we just really felt like we wanted Stacy to be able to stay at home. And so she could be focused on the ministry and focused on the kids. And when she asked me the question, I said, well, she's going to work, but we, we believe God wants her to stay at home. And she started laughing. I like that. And... At the same time, I just started laughing internally. And she goes, there's no way that will happen. There's no way. Do you know how expensive it, like I, like I hadn't seen the prices yet. She's like, do you know how expensive it is to live in the Bay Area? And internally, I could just sense God saying, I got you. I got you. You don't need to worry. I got you. So fast forward last week, two weeks ago. We're in our house and we have this lady there and we're doing this foster the bay initiative. We're opening up our home to um, bring a foster child into our home and they make you fill out all these questionnaires and paperwork. They wanna know the worst sin you've ever committed and make sure you don't beat your kids and all that stuff, which is important. And there's this one page that asks you about your personal finances and how much you pay for your house. So we have this crazy situation and the lady looks at it and she goes, did you make, did you like make a mistake on this? Because when I look at how much you pay, you're paying for your house, it's like you're virtually paying nothing. And this house is, is not like worth nothing. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Let me tell you the story. Let me tell you how God provided. We don't own this house. We just live in it. In fact, God owns it, number one, but somebody else owns it. And they just let us kind of live in it. And they don't charge us anything for it. And this woman... At my kitchen table, who is not a committed follower of Jesus, just starts to weep and cry. She's like, I've never seen anything like this. Your house, your family is so blessed. And I say, yes, we are. We're a blessed family. I, I guess I could, tell you, I could tell you dozens of stories from families from our church of people who've trusted God. See, this whole thing about money is not about what we want from you. I have so much confidence in God's ability to provide for our family and for our church. I do. I just, I, sometimes it's hilarious. Sometimes we give stuff away. Sometimes the church does crazy things, but there's a part of me inside that's just laughing because I know God can and will provide for every need we have. And the deal is, my job's to keep the window open, his job's to keep it coming. So will you trust me? Will you believe that I am faithful, that I can get it to you, no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance? Now, here's the crazy thing about it. Here's the crazy thing. God's heart is one of a giver. And God was never trying to bless the nation of Israel just so there could be like this awesome nation that walked around and said, well, we're the people of God. Look at how awesome we are. God's plan from the beginning of time was to bless the entire world. And he knew if he could find one nation to bless and they would receive it, he could bless the whole world through one nation. So that's why when Jesus would come from heaven to earth, God would give his one and only son to die on a cross for the sins of the world and conquer the grave as a giver, as one who would give of himself. And now that grace to you and that provision to you and me is not something we earn. It's not something we push for or strive for. It's just you receive it. 
And God says, I want to find people that I can get my grace to so I can get my grace through. I want to get my provision to them so I can get through them. So he's trying to raise up a group of people, a family, a church, a life group, anybody that's saying, God, my life is yours. My hands are yours. I'll get it to you if you'll let me get it through you. So I wonder today, will you trust them? So here's the challenge. I'm sorry, the band... I'm sorry, I'm still going. This is, I got freedom now. Um, but I want to challenge you. I'm the, I'm, I'm the guy that you're sitting down across from a table. I don't want to label myself a salesman because I believe in my product and my God way more than somebody who's selling a Nissan. I just want to ask you to trust God, to try him. Just try him out. Here's the, here's the challenge. 90 days, trust him. Just see if he's faithful. I'm the guy on the airplane who's pushing you out. All I'm saying, you just put your feet out on the ledge a little bit and let me push you out. And you got a parachute on your back called the faithfulness of God that has been good, has been true, and can provide for you no matter what your situation and circumstance. Will you stand with me? All of our services, all of our campuses. God, we receive you into our lives. We receive your grace. We receive your mercy. You're faithful. You've been faithful. You'll always be faithful. You don't change. You're good. You're kind. You're true. You're loving. So let us receive and give so that you can be honored, so that the nations can look and say, that is a blessed people. The hand of God is upon them. In Jesus' name, we believe this and we pray it. And God's people said, amen.